You may have a number of goals in your life today and one central goal that is all-consuming. I urge you to pray as to how you can make all of your goals converge at the point of the path of Christhood, that becoming the Christ for you may be a householder, may be having a family and children, having being teachers or professionals or doing all kinds of things that are necessary to the fulfillment of positive momentums of karma and necessary to the balancing of negative karma. All these things can converge. You don't have to let go of anything except it comes under the headings of such things as incorrect livelihood and those points of the Eightfold Path of the Buddha. Whatever is lawful in the purity of the Christ and the Holy Christ Self, whatever is lawful for the Buddhic manifestation within you, which is love and joy and the givingness of self, whatever that is, that can become a part of your Christhood and whatever else you are doing or you are that is not a part of your Christhood, let go of it. Just drop it. Just let it drop. Drop it right here in the heart of the inner retreat at the altar of God. You don't need to have a part of yourself in the astral plane to be happy. You may think you do because you've become dependent upon the, the vibrations of the astral plane and people who are a part of the astral plane or the weight of your own karma and your own emotional body. But if you really desire to be free, you need to know that what is real sacrifice is when you keep all that garbage and all that baggage. That's a sacrifice because you are sacrificing your Christhood to that mess of pottage that will mean nothing to you as far as the ongoing journey of eternal life is concerned. It is no sacrifice to be the Christ. It is the greatest joy and the greatest gift of God to us. We are so humble before that opportunity to walk and talk with our Savior. That is the joy of divine love. When people tell me that I am making so many sacrifices, I tell them that is ridiculous. The whole world is making the sacrifice of foregoing the marvelous union of being caught up as the bride of Jesus Christ with the divine spouse. This is the glory of God. So let us recognize that when we talk about a path of surrender and sacrifice and selflessness and service, it is not a path of self-denial. It is a path of the affirmation of true being and the letting go of all that is unreal about ourselves. This is such an important and intense elixir that I give to you in this moment to forever let go of those things that you keep looking back to and keep looking back to and can't let go of when all of the things that are really important in life are yours in abundance, in joy, in happiness, in glory. There is no path of the sorrowful way. There is no path of burden. Every problem in your life can and will be solved as long as you don't get out of alignment with a living Christ. Let's say you had eight cylinders piled one on the other. And this is kind of a pipe, and it's a pipeline to your presence. So one of these cylinders moves over here because you're caught up in too much self-concern and self-pity. And then another one gets off over here because you're into condemnation and criticism of someone else. And so God wants to save you, and he sends the light down, and the light can't come down because the missing parts uh, of these successive cylinders simply are no longer a tube, a tunnel, where the light can descend and restore you. So you must never allow yourself to get away from the centeredness of God's being. And there's a little mantra that you can give to remind yourself to stay centered. It is a mantra that reminds you that as long as you have ever been, as long as you have ever served God and loved God, he has never, ever let you down. He has never forsaken you. He has never abandoned you, and you have come through what you have had to come through. And the mantra is, and it's from scripture, it says very simply, 
Hitherto hath the Lord helped us, which means he's helped us up to now. He's going to help us from now on and permanently into the future until we are ascended in the light and free. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. 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 Now there is an exchange for having the unlimitless light, power, and consciousness and help of the Lord. And it is remaining centered in that Christ presence, performing the necessary rituals of prayers and decrees and meditations, taking care of your body and your four lower bodies, and not sinning against your neighbor by condemnation, not breaking the commandments, loving the Lord thy God with all thy mind and soul and heart, and thy neighbor as thyself. All of these precepts that are basic to all of the world's religions, you must live by them, demonstrate them, and be an example of them. In other words, you must be the Lord's servant. Now, it is not a question that the Lord says, I won't help that person because he's not my servant. The Lord doesn't say that. But the one who isn't the servant and is not following a path of discipleship has put himself so far out of alignment with these shafts of fire that descend to rescue us that he has placed himself outside of the pale of being rescued. And so we pray for those people who are our loved ones whom we know are not maintaining a real tie to God, and therefore in the day of calamity they may suffer extreme pain and loss, and we grieve for them. And that is why it is so very important that we pray for all mankind and all light bearers of the earth. Because when we maintain the tie and we are not moved, we hold the balance for them so that God can intercede in their behalf even when they do not know the way, they are ignorant, they are untutored, or may, perhaps they are even rebellious. So you need to understand that this is why we pray for people who pass on, that they be cut free by the angels of light. Angels of light descend into the astral plane to rescue departed souls because we make the call. Angels don't ordinarily descend to the astral plane, so someone in embodiment me needs to make the call on behalf of someone else who has passed from the screen of life with no knowledge or internalization of the word of God. So that is why prayer is so ultimately important, and that is why the altars of the world are so magnificent, where there has been established a momentum year upon year upon year of that light of God in the prayers of the people. Archangel Gabriel says that the person who will claim his Christhood and call forth the Father and the Son to take up their abode in his temple may displace the darkness of 10,000 times 10,000 individuals. If you have any doubt in your mind left as to what is the greatest calling in life that you could have, I trust that you do not have it any longer that you understand just what is the power of Jesus Christ and what he is offering to you in the transmission to you of his momentum of his Christhood as you are willing to walk in the footsteps of the path that he has outlined for us. Of course it is so. The definition of the Christ is the incarnation of the word, the word that was with Brahman in the beginning. And that word can be ignited in you, can be increased. The point of Christhood can start with a point of light in the heart, and then it can increase and increase and increase day by day by good works, by love, by prayer, by teaching, by giving of oneself until one has given the whole cup of one's life each day. Can you really say you've given that cup of life all away each day God will fill it again and give you more each day. Each time you empty yourself and you are filled again, you are filled with more light because what you gave is multiplied by the Christ and returned back to you. So the more you give, the more you have to give. And this is the great joy of living on the path of the Holy Spirit. Gabriel said it, and it is so. The person who will claim his Christhood and call forth the Father and the Son to take up their abode in his temple 
may displace the darkness of 10,000 times 10,000 individuals on planet Earth. Think of yourself not having the path, the teaching, or the understanding. Think of ourselves in past centuries when we knew not the way and others kept the flame for us and we depended on the heart of Jesus Christ for our very survival and our very reincarnation again when we would be enlightened. Think how many have stood for us before the altars of God. Think how Moses pleaded to the Lord God to spare the people, how he called for mercy. So many have gone before us to play this role. Now we today can assume that role and that mantle for others. Isn't that the most wondrous opportunity in all incarnations of all existence? The Elohim of the fifth ray, Cyclopeia, teaches that one individual who knows his Christhood is more valuable in the earth in this hour than any other individual of any other capacity. You must place supreme value upon your emergent Christhood. Treat it as a diamond that must be cut and polished and treasured, beloved. Cutting and polishing the diamond of your personal Christhood takes work, hard work, but doesn't anything else you strive for in this world take hard work? It's not worth having unless it took hard work, is it? The Ascended Lady Master Portia says, do not accept that it takes so many years or lifetimes to achieve your Christhood. Neither entertain the folly that the achievement of Christhood is easily won. It is not easily won, beloved, or you yourselves should have long ago won it. You see, we didn't properly assess what it would take. And we didn't properly assess the living truth that it is our right and our divine plan to realize that Christhood. Because the church fathers didn't want us to know that. And so on and so forth, as we know the old story. So I think that some of us have missed that calling just for want of knowledge, want of teachers, want of the immediacy of that truth, want of a community of the Holy Spirit such as this, and for want of the ultimate dedication by our Lord and by Gautama Buddha of Church Universal and Triumphant. That's why communities are founded, and that's why there have been communities through all ages. There is a mutual reinforcement of those who walk side by side and are following the disciplines. When you are around people who don't follow the disciplines, you tend to be as they are. When you know you are a part of a worldwide brotherhood, a world community of light bearers, and when you think to do this or that that's a little bit out of the way, and you remember that thousands of people are holding that level of strength and perseverance and determination, then you say, I can do it too, and I will draw from that strength. And so it is wonderful that we have the sponsorship from beloved El Moria and the Masters to have this community. And it is wonderful that St. Germain sponsored America where we could celebrate our freedom of religion. El Moria says that the disciple, before becoming the Christ, does become on occasion or often the vessel of his Christ self. So first we are the vessel, and in the process of being the vessel of the love of Christ, the truth of Christ, the qualities of the Christ, we are putting on that oil of truth, that oil of love. We are becoming saturated with it and we are beginning to take on its characteristics and we are beginning to think as Jesus thinks. And when we say, what would Jesus do? We know exactly what he would do and therefore what we would do. So it is a very gradual process. It doesn't happen overnight. And that is why you have to be attentive day by day, weaving the cycles, 
weaving the wedding garment. How can you tell when you are the vessel of your Christ self? Beloved Archangel Jophiel and Christine tell us, when you hear yourself saying things that you know your Holy Christ self would not say, then you know that that Holy Christ self has ascended far above you and cannot enter in. When you say things with a tone of voice of condescension with criticism, with burden or depression, sarcasm or the vibration of gossip, then you will know your Holy Christ self cannot enter, for it is the law of God. Therefore, pursue the path of the imitation of Christ. And of course, you all must have that book by Thomas A. Kempis, The Imitation of Christ, reading pages of it daily, reminding yourself what it is to walk in his footprints. Speak as you know or believe Christ would speak, with love but firmness, sternness where required, mercy when it is due, soft spoken when needed. In the intensity of the sacred fire, when you would awake a soul who will not be awakened, speak as Christ would speak, and Christ will speak through you. Think as Christ would think, and Christ will think through you. And the mind of God will become congruent with a physical vessel. When you think thoughts impure, unkind, critical, intolerant, the mind of Christ is not in you in that moment. And when you catch yourself, you make your calls to the violet flame, you apologize to someone, you make things right, and you get right back into that communion with God with ever more alertness to see to it that you are in control of thought, feeling, and spoken word. When you have feelings that are not feelings of the compassionate Christ, then you know Christ is not in you. Then you ask yourself, well, why do I have those feelings? And you start getting out your books on psychology and you read about the inner child and you go to work with those workbooks and you get to the bottom of why you have those feelings so that you will not repeat them. Some feelings, some expressions of emotions are repetitive throughout a person's lifetime. Everyone who knows that person knows that that person gets crabby or does this or does that or does the next thing except the person himself. That's very unfortunate. So you see, when you get to the bottom of why you do things and you solve that problem by love, by decree, even by therapy with a professional, then you will find that you will not repeat these things anymore. And you will have your victory through and through because you have seen your psychology for what it is and you are getting past it and beyond it and mastering it. And this is the path of mastery. So practice sweet thoughts, sweet feelings, sweet words, and soon they will come naturally. Demonstrate them to your children, to one another, and others will speak as you speak, for all humans are imitators. Implicit in this teaching is that someone is going to imitate you whatever you are doing and not necessarily because they are around you but because there is a subconscious communication through the level of the soul throughout the world where people imitate people and momentums and fads grow out of that and so whether you are alone or whether you are with people you are setting an example and other people are imitating you Finally, beloved, perform deeds that you know Christ would perform and shun those which Christ would not engage in. Obedience to the inner voice of God is the first precept of Christhood. This is a fundamental truth. If you are going to obey the inner voice of God, what do you have to do? Listen, listen, right, I heard you say listen. That's right. Some people don't listen because they don't want to hear. Some people actually become physically deaf because lifetime after lifetime they have refused to listen to the voice of God. And so God has taken away their hearing, their outer hearing, as a karma that they might learn to seek him and desire to have that hearing again. 
Jesus told the disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments. The ascended master Jesus says, listen to the inner voice that does guide thee. Before thou speakest in an ungodly manner, the presence does warn, refrain thy speech. It is not pleasing unto the Lord. Each act, each desiring, each contemplation of deceit or ambition, as it does come from the tempter, is rebuked by the Christ. Listen to the inner voice and obey, and all shall be well with thee. How many of you know what it's like to be on the receiving end of a vortex of anger or hatred? <laughs> when you are in that vortex as though you were in the center or being tumbled by a tornado, the energy is so fierce that if you open your mouth to speak to anyone, that energy will come through you in the spoken word. So the key is not to speak. And if someone wants to engage you, whether it's in an argument or in a conversation, you simply have to say, excuse me, I have a pressing matter to take care of. <laughs> Now, when I asked you if you knew what it felt like to be in that vortex, I actually wasn't visualizing you being confronted directly in person by someone who's very angry and who's shouting and screaming. That's another confrontation that we know about. But the more difficult one to detect and to be alert to and to deal with is where this sending comes from far away, from sources unknown to you or perhaps sources you suspect. And that is the part that I want to address today. Because that anger is unknown, and because you are busy doing whatever you are doing, you may start getting the idea that you yourself feel angry, and yet you have nothing to feel angry about. But because most of us take things as being our fault, we start saying, well, I must have this anger in my being. It must be coming up out of a record or whatever because I myself am really not angry at anyone about anything. And yet this anger persists and persists and persists and weighs you down. So when you determine very clearly that you really have no conflict with anyone, no beef, no bone to pick, nothing going on between you and any individual, and you have not allowed yourself to become angry over any situation, then you are dealing with an outside planetary force of some kind that may simply be the force of Antichrist attacking the path of your personal Christhood. It's important to be alert to this and to get alert to it early and to realize that that kind of energy does not go away. It does not go away unless you do something about it because it is personally directed at you by someone who is unknown or by a mass entity that is attacking, for instance, your work in the pro-life movement or your work for this or that cause. And so as you have taken up a cause that is a national or a world cause, so the forces opposing that cause, they will pinpoint you. So it's very important that you realize that you can be in a vortex of anger that is so intense that if you open your mouth to speak, the anger will actually come through your mouth. You will express anger verbally. And this is a major initiation. And I would like all of you to pass this test whenever it comes upon you for the rest of your life. Let's go back to the situation where this is a personal encounter with someone and there is an angry exchange, there is an argument, there's a difference of agreement. And as a result of this, you may be feeling self-righteous, you may be feeling that you are right and the other person is wrong, you may be angry because of something they have done, 
some particular situation. You may be angry at somebody who has run into your car and made your day and so forth. So in that particular case, you have to decide to disconnect yourself from that anger. And you need to visualize it because it's wonderful to visualize physical things. So you visualize yourself taking this cord and pulling the plug. So here is your choice. You have to say to yourself, maybe you really are right, but being right isn't the ultimate point here. Being harmonious and being the Christ is the ultimate point. And so if you are right and someone else is not going to admit that, what you have to be concerned about is making peace with your God. I gave a lecture about Moses in New York, and I drew from this concept of staying plugged into God, how to stay plugged into God every day of your life. So here you have two, cho you have two choices. You're holding this, this plug. Are you going to plug it in to this argument, or are you going to plug it into God immediately and let the light descend and consume this anger, this disagreement, and recognize that the only real important thing that you have to do in this life, no matter what vicissitudes and karma you plow through, is to be loving to everyone you meet, no matter if you think this is the worst person, the worst person that was ever born on planet Earth. It's the love that you express that tallies and that builds your bank account and balances karma and is the molding of the Christ in you. So if it is love that you want and God's love flowing through you, you have to disconnect. You simply have to disconnect. You have to let them have the last word. You have to be silent. Either allow them to go on in a tirade or excuse yourself by and by. But whatever it is, serve the Christ in that person. We are all servants. Who are we servants of? I am the servant of the Christ in you, and I am the servant of your soul. You are the servant of the Christ in one another and the servant of that soul. So instead of thinking about how you are being wronged and mistreated and misjudged and persecuted and gossiped against and so forth, start thinking, how can I comfort this soul who is so burdened that they have this need to do this to me and to do it to other people? So if you remember the words of Jesus, the servant is not greater than his Lord. It's a very profound teaching. Who is my Lord? My Lord is the Christ of you and everyone. My Lord is Jesus Christ. So if I am serving you and you mistreat me when I am serving you, I have to remember that I am the servant, I am no greater than your Christ self, and I am not going to mis mistreat you in any way because in that way I am sinning against the Christ who lives in you. So if you have reverence for what the Hindus call the Atman, which is actually like a miniature Brahman living within you, if you know that God is in someone and you are the servant of that God and you can keep that in the front of your mind, I tell you, you will pass your tests from this day forward the rest of your life. And that's what I want to see you do. That's my goal for you. You're watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and founder of Summit University. Summit University is located at the beautiful Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. If you'd like more information, call 1-800-245-5445. That's 1-800-245-5445. You really can't be obedient to the inner voice of your Christ self or the Master's commandments if you do not have trust. 
Where does trust come from? In this life and in previous lifetimes, we learn trust from our parents. If we can count on our parents, if they are there for us, we begin to trust and to have the sense that we can trust. We can give our trust to the most important people in our lives. But suppose you were abandoned as a child. Suppose you went from home to home. Suppose that everyone that ever took care of you mistreated you. That builds a momentum of mistrust that is very difficult for people to come through. So trust is not something that is automatic. It is either built into us or it is not. And this is why we need to be very careful with people and especially with children. If we give our word, then we must keep our word or not give it. Trust then. Trust even comes before faith. Trust is, I can count on you, God. I can count on you, my parents. I can count on you, my friend, my priest, my pastor, my fellow Chila on the path. If you don't have that, you are cursed. I mean, it is truly a curse. I know people who cannot trust anyone, including themselves, because they have been so damaged psychologically. This is why Mother Mary has said we should work on our psychology, because if you can't even get past that step on the path, where are you? You don't see God. You see him in the outplaying of events. How do you learn to trust someone you can't see when you can't trust the most important people in your life whom you can see? Think about this and go after your healing in this matter. I don't ask you to trust me. Mark Prophet's famous statement is, trust no man or woman. Trust no one, but trust the Christ of each person. Speak to the Christ of the person. Go directly to the reality of the person. Trust their Holy Christ self and call the Holy Christ self and the I am presence of a person to act through the person and deal justly with you. To trust anyone more than you trust God, of course, is idolatry. Nothing short of idolatry. So having been betrayed by the most significant people in your early life, you may become nervous when you think you have to trust someone. Your trust in others comes from your taking a soul reading of that person through your own soul. Your soul will never err in telling you whether someone is trustworthy or not. So often, you don't want to believe that someone is lying to you or someone is not trustworthy, but you must listen to your inner Christ. If you haven't learned to trust God in others, you do not have the trust in God that will be your anchor as you go through the storms of life. Life brings good times and bad times. You have to know that neither good nor bad in the human sense is real. Human badness, human goodness is not ultimate reality. On the path of personal Christhood, you have to trust God and the guru and yourself. The guru being the God manifestation of the ascended masters. The next most important quality on the path besides trust is trustworthiness, being worthy of being trusted yourself. If you have not had people around you that you could trust, the best way to balance that karma to make your statement is to make a decision, I'm going to be trustworthy even if my parents and the most significant people in my life were not. The absence of trust comes from fear. But where does fear come from besides the patterns, the psychological patterns of our parents? It comes from our very own bodies. First of all, your body is the temple of the living God or is so intended to be. Every organ, every cell, every chakra, and then the four lower bodies together is a vessel for light. So if any one of your organs is out of commission, is ill, is toxic, is not the way it should be, 
then that organ, whether it is your kidneys, your lungs, your heart, your liver, etc., that organ cannot be a chalice or light. So one by one, each of the organs needs to come to the balance of the great Tao, the Tai Chi, the yin and yang. That is our goal, and that is why we use scientific principles. Now, some people say to me, well, each person has to find his own diet. What's right for one isn't right for another. I don't agree with that. I'm just telling you, I do not agree with that. I'm not saying you have to stop believing that. I'm just letting you know my position because you have let me know your position. <laughs> According to macrobiotic principles of diet, there is a relationship between psychological problems and weaknesses in the various organs of the physical body. There are positive and negative attributes associated with different organs when they are strong or weak. Fear indicates that you have a weakness, a stress, or an imbalance either in your kidneys, your bladder, or your sexual organs. When you suddenly feel like you are trembling and you associate it with fear, think about what you have eaten in your lifetime, in the past year, and in the past few hours, and see whether you have overburdened these organs and therefore are suffering from a fear that is really an illusion. When there is weakness in these organs, you are prey to fear. You are vulnerable to fear. You are apt to become anxious and have anxiety when there is no cause for alarm whatsoever. You are likely to be timid, indecisive, and protective of yourself instead of opening up and being able to give yourself to the whole world. An indecision, the inability to make a decision because this fear is actually a yin condition. So you may also feel vulnerable, have anxiety, a lack of self-confidence, and be unable to accept new challenges, all because you haven't taken up your resource books on macrobiotics and said, what can I do to heal my kidneys? What can I do to heal my bladder? What can I do to heal my sexual organs? There are wonderful books written that can teach you how to eat, what to eat, how to prepare it, so that your food is your medicine. Extreme imbalance in the body, specifically in these organs, can cause paranoia. And ultimate ex extremes where people actually have to be un under some kind of drugs to sedate them from their tremendous fear. When these organs are functioning properly, you will exhibit courage, a healthy curiosity about life, and an adventuresome spirit. Nothing will get you down because you will have conquered fear. When there is a weakness in your heart or small intestines, you may be hyperactive, boisterous, superficial, or erratic. An extreme imbalance in the heart or small intestine can make you excessively passionate. Excessively passionate. When your heart and small intestine are strong, you will be peaceful, calm, and adaptable. Can you adapt to a situation? Can you adapt to a crisis? Or do you get all discombobulated because one little thing went wrong in your life? And then lose your harmony and, and of course, be off the, the, the path of your Christhood. So this is very, very important that you take this to heart. People like to look at their psychology, their karma. Other people are the cause of their problems. Everything but the fact that we live in a physical temple and the condition of that temple is reflected 
in our whole attitude to life. When there is a weakness in your spleen, pancreas, or stomach, you might be cynical about life, just plain cynical. You can be jealous, jealous of something that somebody else has that you don't have. You've forgotten all about the fact that you can have anything you want in this life if you're willing to work for it. You may be over-dependent or insecure. That's a weakness in the spleen, pancreas, or stomach. An extreme imbalance in these organs can cause you to be suspicious and distrustful or to indulge in self-pity. Now, when you think about it, being suspicious, being distrustful, having self-pity, these are not normal states of mind of a whole person, of someone you respect. Nobody likes to be suspicious, but a lot of people are. Or are they distrustful? Or you hear the endless self-pity, woe is me. And if you know someone like that who's close to you, you constantly have to support this person. But what you're really supporting is their spleen, pancreas, and stomach. <laughs> so by and by, you decide to become a, a marvelous macrobiotic cook, and you start feeding this person everything he needs for his spleen, pancreas, and stomach, and by and by, you find that he's feeling less sorry for himself, and you're no longer having to support the spleen, pancreas, and stomach. This can also produce feelings of martyrdom. Feelings of martyrdom. It's very unfortunate what happened in Waco, Texas. But think about this consciousness of martyrdom that, as we understand it, Dave Koresh had. We don't know because we don't have all the facts. But the sense that he would have to die because of whoever he thought he was. Feelings of martyrdom. I'll wager you that the diet of himself and the people with him created this sense of fear, this sense of having to band together in this enclave and defend oneself against whatever. When your spleen, pancreas, and stomach are strong, you will be understanding compassionate, resourceful, and steadfast. Steady, steady, steady. No matter what time of the day or night someone needs you, you are there, you are steady. You will be self-reliant and generous because you are strong and healthy and vibrant and have this outgoing sense. You can give yourself away because you have stored in the batteries of these organs that energy you need to give yourself to life. When your lungs and large intestine are weak, you may be disinterested, disinterested in life, lethargic, melancholic, or have low self-esteem. You may become incapacitated and unable to cope with minor problems or adversity. You hear yourself saying to someone, I just can't deal with this. I just can't take it. Leave me alone. You know, I, can't, I just can't do this right now. Well, you've got to tend to your lungs and your large intestine, and you have to be a scientist, and you have to know that food is a science, the body is a science, and if you want to live a long life and make sure you make your ascension and realize your Christhood, you're going to have to change your ways. An extreme weakness can cause you to be extremely depressed. When your lungs and large intestine are strong, you will be positive, practical, and stable. You'll be able to develop self-discipline. You can't whip your horse. I mean, if your organs are weak, you just can't whip them every day and say, now you're going to be self-disciplined today. If the organs aren't, just don't have the carrying capacity, they can't carry the light. Here you have these chakras, these marvelous chakras, and the light is shining. And the light wants to go into the organs for the resurrection of those organs. But the organs aren't providing a chalice. They're not healthy. So you keep whipping a horse, you whip the horse, you whip the horse, and you don't get any better. 
because you've got to feed the horse. You've got to feed him properly. When your liver and gallbladder are weak, you may be domineering, irritable, and insensitive. An extreme imbalance can cause you to be angry or violent. When your liver and gallbladder are strong, you will be patient, thoughtful, and orderly. The macrobiotic diet that is right for you will establish the correct balance of yin and yang forces within you and heal the weaknesses of your organs. The healthier your organs are, the more light you will hold. The more light you hold here in polarity with your Holy Christ Self, the more the Holy Christ Self will descend into your temple. You cannot provide a chalice for the fullness of your Christ consciousness if you have not established a strong physical body. Now I'm going to talk to you about the threefold flame. One of the keys to attaining Christhood is balancing and expanding the threefold flame of your heart. Your threefold flame is your divine spark. It's the spark of fire from God's own heart with which he endowed you in the beginning. It's the permanent reality of you. Let's think of all that we call this. We call it the Holy Christ flame. We call it the threefold flame of liberty. We call it the divine spark. We call it the, At the Atman. We call it the seed of the Buddha. All these things are one and the same. There is that point of light in the secret chamber of your heart that means you're a son and a daughter of God. And because you have the spark, you can one day contain and be the whole flame. This threefold flame is depicted with three plumes, power for the Father, wisdom for the Son, love for the Holy Spirit, blue, yellow, and pink. To balance the threefold flame is to bring them to the same level. They, these plumes have gotten out of balance because we have been out of balance, whether physically or in what we have done in our lives. So let us then know that if we are lacking in wisdom, we will pursue it. If we are lacking in love, we will practice giving love and receiving love. If we're lacking in the will of God, in the, in the power of God, such as feeling powerless in our bodies, we'll do something about it, including correcting our diet. Power begins when you create the proper vessel for it. So the threefold flame is not going to expand until you balance it. Portia says, when the threefold flame is balanced and when it does increase, lo, there is the Christ born. Jesus says that balancing the threefold flame involves balancing your karma because it is karma, your words, thoughts, and deeds, and feelings that have caused the threefold flame to get out of kilter. You cannot suddenly raise up the blue plume in proper proportion to the other two if you have not balanced the karma of the abuse of power and of the will of God, and if you have not understood the causes of your misuse of the first ray. And you can only gain an understanding of those causes if you will pursue the study of your psychology. The not-self of you resists studying psychology. I just want you to know that there's a part of you that does not want to get involved in dealing with psychology. Why? Because it's very painful and it is hard to work on your own psychology. You will go through records of the past through a great deal of pain before you come to the bliss of perfect union with your Christ self. It is something you must not neglect. I have seen people in their 70s, in their 80s, in their 90s, not come to a resolution of something that happened to them when they were five years old or 16 years old. They have never actually worked through it. So they still are revolving these records of pain. There is not inner resolution because they have not gone to work with the books we recommend or with experts, professionals that can help them. Now that is a very sad day when a person is on the path of their ascension and has achieved considerable light, considerable balancing of karma, and yet is actually held back because of not dealing with psychology. It will not automatically go away just because you decree. 
The violet flame will consume the cause effect record and memory, but you have to consciously undo this. You have to consciously look at it in your whole soul and your whole being, and then you will be free forever. You will never have to carry that baggage should you reincarnate or should you be an ascended master tied to the earth with some karma left to balance. It will be over and done with if you let go. You have to let go and you have to forgive yourself and others. That's the beginning. Seeing the causes, beloved, is most of the victory. First is seeing the causes. Second is the desiring to be rid of them and their effects. And third is the will, the absolute God will in you that says, I will do it, I will do it now, for nothing is impossible to me in God. By studying your psychology, you will be gaining self-knowledge. How many people here really think you know yourself through and through? <laughs> A couple brave souls know themselves through and through. I'm very glad that you have come to that self-knowledge. Talking about self-knowledge as one of the keys to personal Christhood, Gautama Buddha explains that the first self-knowledge you must have is that of your reality, your God reality, your ultimate reality. You have to know that reality. Even if you know it by meditation or you know it by sensing, you have to sense that you are founded on the rock of Christ. You are embedded in the bedrock of reality, if you will. You are part of what is real and what is foundational to the universe. You are part of the great central sun. You came forth from your father, mother, God. You have that essence of God in you. The major part of you is real. The very smallest part of you is not real. So you study the teachings to find out all about your God reality. And Gautama Buddha says, when you are grounded in the self-knowledge of your reality, then you begin to study your unreal self because then you will not be moved by whatever antics this unreal self is going through because you are absolutely rooted in the reality of your source. Your self-knowledge must then be of that unreal self and of that unreality. He who knows both and stands poised between the two, he who knows how to daily affirm his reality that will swallow up his unreality, that one is a wise man, a wise woman, a wise child. Sometimes in our busy lives, it's hard to find time to study the teachings as Gautama Buddha advises us to. Jesus then gave us one solution, and it is a wonderful solution. He says, get up out of bed in the morning, 15 minutes early, with full concentration upon my teaching, Take one of my books, read it for 15 minutes, carry that book with you, have it near you throughout the day, remind yourself of what you read, ponder it, internalize it, embody the teaching you have read from me for one day. Jesus says a morsel will suffice for the divine alchemy. It's like a leaven that leavens the whole lump. Christ's teaching to us are 11. All we need is a one thought, two thoughts, four thoughts to carry us through the day, sticking with those thoughts. That's why you like calendars that have a thought for the day. The tools are before you. Let them not rust upon the bench. End of Jesus' quote. Another key on the path of personal Christhood is the violet flame. Lady Master Lito says the violet flame facilitates your fusion with your Holy Christ Self. Omri Tas says the violet flame can penetrate bone substance itself to render supple again all of thy body and inner being, to be remolded in the fullness of the stature of Christ. You are not mere creatures, prisoners of habit, but you must know this. You must look at your momentums. You must study the teachings on momentum given to you in the lost teachings of Jesus as well as the Corona class lessons on the subject of habit. You must put down those untoward momentums 
and recreate the new momentum. When there is a groove in consciousness, fill it with light and begin again as you would be, as your Christ self is. The preceding lecture was given by Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and spiritual teacher. This is a presentation of the Summit Lighthouse, an international spiritual organization dedicated to universal enlightenment. Founded in 1958, the Summit Lighthouse is a beacon of truth to thousands worldwide and a leader in New Thought spirituality. This program is brought to you by the Summit Lighthouse. For more information, call 1-800-245-5445 or visit our website at www.summitlighthouse.org. Outside the USA, call 406-848-9500 or write to the Summit Lighthouse, 63 Summit Way, Gardner, Montana, 59030, USA.